Part four, Blessings in the Kumbu, chapter 13. Pablo focused on his soup as Jim described his experience at 23,000 feet last year. Michael spoke up. It was about there on Manisley when I started feeling the altitude, but we should start using those from Camp 3, right? Yes, but supplemental oxygen is not a substitute for acclimatization, John Paul chimed in. You all must get to C3 without oxygen, spend the night in Dutton style, and get a to get a chance to summit in the next few weeks. The table became quiet. They all knew there would be benchmarks, milestones, and rules, but hearing it now sitting in Namchi Bazaar over dinner, the reality hit home. The next day, they stopped for apple pie, where what is known as the world's highest bakery in Kumchung. They toured the secondary school, a.k.a. the Hillary School, funded in part by the Himalayan Trust. Harvard marvel, marveled at the enthusiasm of the kids, how polite they were, how full of life. She was going to tell her kids about this experience the next time they complained that the cable TV was out or their phone wouldn't stay charged. One of the lasting memories they all agreed upon was the constant view of Ama de Blom. While not the highest in Sargamat, the National Park, it had to be the most iconic. It seemed to loom over every valley and bee in every photo. Amin Ablam means mother's necklace. And the visible snow bulb above about two-thirds up the peak may be one of the most recognizable landmarks in all of mountaineering. The long ridges on each side symbolize a mother's ama arms protecting her child. The hanging glacier, de Blom, is similar to a double pendant containing pictures of the gods worn by the Sherpa women. In any event, the 22,349-foot peak was probably the most photographed mountain thus far for the team. Back to the Panorama Lodge for the last of their three nights, Harper was feeling good, healthy, full of energy and life. This trip was just what Harper needed. The next day, they left for another milestone, visiting the Tengboshe Monastery and receiving a blessing from a local lama in the small Himalayan village of Tengboshe. Leaving Namche felt like leaving home. Harper had come to peace with the modernization, understanding the prosperity it brought to the local people, especially the kids. She hoped that bad parts of Western life wouldn't rub off on these special people. The trail continued to be spectacular. Turning the corner just out of Namshi, yet another view unveiled of Amadablam and the Dodi Kosi River cutting its way through the deep valley. The trail was wide and smooth. They passed a stupa celebrating the 50th anniversary of the first summit of Everest. Harper paused, overlooking the deep river valley with Amit Ablam protecting her child. Harper offered a prayer of gratitude. The trail meandered up and down a few rock obstacles, but it wasn't serious as they passed through several Sherpa villages, each with a long table display displaying souvenirs for sale, mostly locally handmade. Harper fought the urge to buy one of everything. The trail became a distinct uh, descent towards the river. It had snowed the previous night, so parts of it was muddy and slippery, but the yaks had no problem. At the bottom of the ravine, they stopped for lunch at the single village of Punkai Tinga at 10,660 feet. It was time to regain elevation. The trail climbed through the dense forest. It was a welcome relief from the hot sun outside of Namshi. A few monks in their crimson roads walked past, some going up, others going down. The trail was surprisingly steep. I forgot about this part, Jim moaned. No wonder I would too, Dutch chimed in. Thinking there was no end to the ever uppers trail, without fanfare, a rock-framed entry appeared. On the other side was a stunningly flat, grassy area, and the Tangboche monastery, monastery stood to their left. Yaks grazed quietly on the short grass in front of the monastery. The Buddhist monastery is the largest in the Kumbu. At one time, hundreds of monks called it home. Now there are less than 60. It was built in six, 1916, but it was destroyed by an earthquake in 1934, and it burned down from a short in electrical wiring in 1989. But donations from around the world helped to rebuild it. Tibetans hand-painted the murals inside and helped build a 50-foot high Buddha. They arrived around three o'clock in the afternoon, just in time for afternoon prayers before planning to head down to Deboche for a night at the Riverdale Lodge. Dawa gathered the group together. Do you want to attend prayers? Yes, Harper said, along with the couple and Dutch. The others were content to get to the lodge, tired after their long up and down. Take off your shoes and no photography inside, please, Dawa advised. 
They hustled up to the stone steps, out of breath, also tired from a long day. There were a few other observers gathered outside the massive wooden door. It was quiet for a few moments, and then a young monk came. He opened the door quietly, welcoming everyone into the monastery. The first sight was a large golden Buddha. The statue had a peaceful look in his eyes. Harper noticed the small dark windows that barely let any light inside. The brightly painted walls and the large drums that sat beside five or six rows of low benches. A pile of robes awaited the guest. Rows of butter lamps sat in front of a Buddha, plus a donation box. Harper intended to make a donation after the prayers. They sat on the Tibetan rugs to the right of the central area. It was cold, and the guests could see their breath. Harper zipped her down jacket up tighter, pulled her cap down over her ears. She tugged on her gloves. Her socked feet were cold. Now she understood why the monks were wearing the heavy crimson robes. One by one, the monks entered the main hall. It appeared each one had their place, seated by seniority or by position. Nevertheless, everyone joined in kind of a rumpled fashion and settled onto their pillowed seat, cross-legged with the crimson robe covering almost all their body except for their bald heads. Soon, two young monks, perhaps 10, 14, or 16 years old, began to serve hot tea to their elders. It was a purposeful moment, but not overly formal. One of the monks sneezed. No one offered a gazuntite or even a Buddha bless. Without a clue, the drum beats began. One of the senior monks started his chant, actually a prayer. Others soon joined in. They created an unbelievable resonance that built as it bounced off the artfully painted walls. Harper closed her eyes to take the moment in without the filter of sight. It was spiritual and sensory. They quietly left the monastery after prayers. Harper was changed forever. It was one of those moments, one of those sounds that would echo within her throughout her life. She reflected on what had just happened as she descended into the rhododendron forest to the village of Debouche. They enjoyed a restful night in a comfortable Riverdale Inn, arising to an impressive view of Amida Blom backlit in the light of the sunrise. Harper went outside, standing beside an oversized Tibetan mastiff, looking at Mother Necklace until it was time for breakfast. By now, the entire team of climbers and trekkers had their packing and unpacking drill down to a science. Get up, pack your sleeping bag and your overnight items into your duffel, put it outside your door, and thank the porter who dropped it off later at the end of the day at the next tea house. They left in an orderly manner for their next blessing in Pingboche, and then on to Dingboche for two nights. Ever Space Camp was only a few days away now. Harper had, Harper had heard about Lama Geshe for years. He gave blessings to thousands of trekkers and climbers. He was beloved by many. Harper was sad when he passed away in 2018. Now, Lama Nawag Pajar performed the, the blessing for the climbers at the Pengboche Monastery. This was her first ceremony of this type. She joined her teammates with anticipation sitting cross-legged on the thick Tibetan carpets. The ceremony started with the Lama and two other monks chanting prayers for about 45 minutes. At various times, cymbals and drums and horns joined in. The Lama chanted while waving his arms, rice flew in the air. The climbing Sherpas with palms pressed together in front of their chest, head bowed, sat in front of the Lama. The climbers looked on with a mix of emotions before moving to the Lama for their blessing. He took a silk scarf, a kacha, and placed it around each person's neck, and then a gold string, a sanji, and tied it around their neck with a loose knot. Throughout the entire blessing, he would look the person straight in the eye. The meaning was clear. When he, placed his, when he gently placed his forehead against theirs, it was, af, it was as if to say, go in peace. All is well. After their moment, Claudia and Pablo walked away with tears in their eyes. Michael, Dutch, and Jim had huge smiles. But Tony, he had no expression at all. As the Lama finished with a blessing for everyone, Dawa translated. The Lama told them to only have a positive thought, never think negatively. He said to forgive mistakes and to be kind to other people. As they left the monastery, Harper noticed the wind had picked up and the prayer flags waved in the breeze. Harper could almost hear the prayers printed on the blue, white, red, green, and yellow flags. There'd be more prayers and ceremonies before they started climbing. Harper looked forward to the puja at base camp, where another lama would trek in 
to conduct an elaborate ceremony to ask permission, forgiveness, and safety to climb the mountain. Already Harper was enjoying their prayers before sleeping or starting the day and the chanting the climb of Sherpas as they walked together on the trail. Yes, sometimes climbing mountains is more than climbing. As Claudia had shared over at the first team dinner in Kathmandu, she and Pablo had been a couple for six years. They both assumed they would get married one day, but for the moment, getting their careers launched, hers as a physical therapist and he, a geologist, took priority. However, they both loved the outdoors. Born in Ecuador, Claudia and Pablo had met in college, and the rest was history. They instantly fell in love and graduated and moved in together to pool their resources and fund their climbs. Like many of their teammates, they had climbed Aconcagua and Denali, but Pablo had serious trouble on both. Claudia later told Harper, he was going so slow on Denali, he had trouble pulling the sleds plus carrying the pack. Harper nodded. I understand it was tough for me. How'd he do above the ranger camp? Claudia didn't like to talk about Pablo without him there, but she went on knowing that Harp, she and Harper had developed a tight bond. He did well on the head wall since we left the sleds at 14, but when we got to high camp at 17, the altitude hit him hard. We had climbed to 20,000 back home on Cotopaxi and Chimborazo, and he struggled, but he made both. She looked around for her best friend, hoping he would join the conversation. Pablo was shy talking about his experiences and sometimes felt overshadowed by Claudia and her skills. The two women talked some more, letting the conversation drift to family. Do you want children? Harper asked. Yes, I want four. Pablo wants five, she said with a huge smile, exposing perfect teeth. Wow, I can barely keep up with two, Harper said, laughing. I couldn't do it without my husband, Mark, however. But now we want to take advantage of being young and having some extra money and time off from our jobs. We hope to go to Pakistan next summer, maybe climb another 8,000 meter mountain. Of course, that assumes we get up Everest. Honestly, Harper, I'm worried about Pablo. He sometimes talks himself into a negative place and gives up too easy. About this time, a line of porters snaked around the tea house. They paused to look at them. I don't know how they carry such heavy loads, Claudia said. I don't think most of us would be here without them. Harper agreed, adding, and the Sherpas are simply amazing. Tell me, what, tell me what happened to Pablo in Aconcagua, and how did you get him to the summit? Well, it was difficult, very difficult. Again, he didn't do well until we got to the high camp at 19,500 feet. He was there, he felt weak and tired, he wanted to turn back. He took, he took, on extra, it took an extra night for him to rest and felt better. Our Argentinian guides were wonderful, very patient. So we left at midnight and walked very slowly in the dark. We took a lot of breaks and had extra food and water. When the sun came up, Pablo's spirits also rose. He seemed to gain en energy from the sun, and it picked up his pace. It was nice to stand on the summit together, especially after what had happened on Denali. I know if he can keep going at sunrise that he'll summit Everest, but we need to get him to Camp 3 first. Every step from there will be an altitude record for my dear one. Claudia let her gaze drift off to Ahmed Blanc. Chapter 14, Leaving the Trees. Dutch stood still, staring at Amit Blom as he got up early at the Rivendell Lodge in Bebochet. I would like to climb that one day, he said to Michael, Tony, and Jim. Me too, said Tony. They all looked at him. He'd only made two comments the entire time they'd been together, both about mountains and climbing. I understand it's a combination of rock, ice, and snow climbing, all at moderate altitude, Michael added. They threw the day packs around their backs and left the lodge in a single file line. It snowed last night, so the trees had a beautiful white coating that muffled any sounds. Crossing a bridge over a small st stream, a team of climbers, trekkers, and climbing sherpas started to gain altitude. After a few hours, they noticed something. Hey, where'd the trees go? Harper asked rhetorically. They had left tree line and now were following a narrow dirt path made by perhaps millions of steps over centuries. 350 years earlier, Tibetans settled what is known as today as the Kumbu Valley, along with the Rolling and the Kumbulung Valleys. They are all considered sacred places. Many of the climbing Sherpas who support climbers today live in these valleys. Harper told the group that she found on Wikipedia before she went home that, quote, according to the Sherpa, Sherpa's oral history, four groups migrated from, to Tibet from, to the Solo Kumba area at different times, giving rise to four fundamental clans. 
These four groups gradually split into more than 20 different clans that exist today. At one point, the Sherpas had their own state, but slowly, Nepal took them under their government rule. The Dutch asked Dawa, why did the Sherpas risk their lives on Everest for us? Dawa stopped. He looked over the barren terrain towards Dingbache. Climbing is what Sherpas do. I'll guide as long as I physically can to support my family. Guiding Everest is one of the most lucrative jobs in Nepal next to being a government official. But my parents, my wife, they're adamant about my brothers and I stop guiding on Everest. I want a better life for my children. Like my parents, I don't want them to be a mountain guide, maybe on a lower mountain like Amitabhong or Lobache or Trekkie, but not on Everest. It's just too dangerous. They're in boarding school at Kathmandu now, and I can only pay for it by guiding on Everest. But I want them to go to college, maybe be a doctor, an engineer, or something else. The entire group has stopped to listen to Dava speak. Okay, let's go, he said as the group reformed their single file line on the dirt trail. They tried to avoid stepping on the fragile tundra. Yaks passed them by, returning from base camp. The trail dropped towards the Imakola River, one of the primary drainages from the Kumbu Icefall in Everest. They crossed a wooden bridge and started regaining elevation. You're at the top of the final hill. She paused to look back a habit that she'd learned from other climbs. You know, sometimes you have to look behind you to appreciate where you've come from before you go on to live in the moment. Harper was stunned by what she saw. Tamsirku, 21,725 feet, and Kentega, 22,251 feet. Stunning, stunning, majestic Himalayan peaks. The trek in the Kumbu continued to surprise her. Every turn brought another view Every view, another delight. Every delight, another memory made. Chapter 15, Remembering. The Mount Everest guide team spent the afternoon as an active rest day at nearly 14,500 feet in the village of Dingboche, with a walk to take in a seldom seen sides of two famous peaks, Lhotse and Amitabhong. Dutch and Tony especially want to see the south face of Lhotse Peak. This impressive wall has been only used three times for a successful summit bid, the last in 1990. They walked by a memorial to three Polish climbers who had died attempting it. The Polish alpinist legend Jerry Kuzuka, and for the past several years, an amazing team of Koreans led by Hong Sung Tech had given it all they have but had come up short making it to the top. It's deep of hanging seracs and it's avalanche prone. The other peak they wanted to check out was the North Ridge of Am de Blanc. By now, the team had many pictures of the Southeast Ridge they saw trekking out of Namchi, but the other side is totally different on this mountain. It's steep, full of cornices, and it had only been successfully climbed 103 times with the last time in 2007. This record compared to the more popular Southeast Ridge, which had more than 4,300 summits. The very last section up the ridge is full of loose, soft snow, and that stops most effort. Look at that ridge line, Dutch said. I can see why no one has summited recently. It looks like soft ice cream. The next day, the team left for Lobache, climbing the next hill to Dingboche. There, they hit their high point thus far on the trek at 16,500 feet before dropping back down to the one, built, one building village called Dukla, Dugla. They stopped for pastries and coffees before climbing another 1,000 feet to the pass. Taking a very wide trail, almost like a road up from Dugla, the team rested and crested at Dugla Pass at 16,000 feet. They came upon an open area that was filled with rock shortens or memorials. The area was known as Chukla Lar. Harper paused. Known the memorial was here from her research, but she was still shocked by the sheer number. Harper went over to one of the closest on her right. The name on the plaque read Scott Fisher. Another Pasang. Sonia Sherpa. Harper began to walk the line of stone memorials trying to read each name. Most were climbing Sherpa. Harper reflected on what it takes to climb Everest and the sacrifices these men and women show each year. But Harper had another mission. Before she left home, she had received an email that read in part, can you see if his memorial is still there? The email was from the 80-year-old father of a fallen Everest climber. The rest of the team had moved on toward the next stop at Lobache, but Harper stayed behind. 
Pasang, one of the climbing shirts, stayed with her. The father's request was on his mind, her mind. Many of the monuments had new bronze nameplates. A few were worn after years of wind and rain. Some were famous like Scott Fisher's and Babu Cherry, but most were not familiar. Laying names long since forgotten by the climbing community. However, names are remembered daily by their family. Harper stopped at one. How did they die? Weather? Health? Accident? It really didn't matter. There were Sherpas from many countries. Belarus, Japan, Austria, Canada, Nepal. Most were Sherpa. Most were young. Climbers following their passion, chasing their dream, doing a job. The setting was perfect. Just above treeline, on the alpine tundra, views of the mountains. They would have liked it. Harper went one by one to East Chorton, letting her glove finger trace the characters in the carved stone. Harper soon said out loud, I'm sorry, sir. I never found Greg's memorial, but I'm sure his memory lives on every day in you.